Um, I'm Ellen Chesler. I'm a senior fellow at the Roosevelt Institute, and I'm very pleased to be here. And I hope, as the moderator of the panel, you'll indulge me if I <coughs> use just a few minutes by way of introduction to make a little personal statement about why I'm so pleased to be moderating this panel, which unites government with equality and social justice. And I do so in part because I think I'm one of the few people today who is speaking, uh, other than Eric, of course, who actually worked in government. Um, I was trained as a historian in the 1970s up at Columbia, <coughs> but facing few tenure track opportunities back then for historians and uh, with personal and family ties to New York City, uh, I had the good fortune to take my then volunteer night job and make it a day job. Uh, and exactly 35 years ago, as a few people like Sarah Kovner will remember who are in this room, uh, I left academia and uh, joined first the campaign and then the administration of New York City Council President Carol Bellamy, the first woman ever elected to a city or statewide office in her own right in New York. Uh, indeed, incredibly enough, since it doesn't seem that long ago to me, uh, and perhaps to some of you in the room. Carol was the first woman anywhere in America ever to receive a million votes, uh, New York being a substantial polity with a lot of voters. Uh, and I always like to remind Hillary Clinton that she may have put 18 million cracks in the glass ceiling, but the first million were Carol's. <laughs> These were heady days um, as the city began to emerge from decades of neglect, uh, from considerable administrative incompetence, and from the throes of a fiscal crisis, um, which was really brought on by years of backroom shady deals, lack of transparency or accountability in government, uh, which also threw government into some serious disrepute. All in all, ours was a 24-7 tutor 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 tutorial in policy and politics. And for those of you who are old enough to remember, the many spats between Carol and Ed Koch, the politics could be extraordinarily fierce. Um, yet, we collaborated uh, along with uh, a wonderful controller of the city of New York, Jay Golden, and left a legacy of innovation, of which I am very proud, in fiscal and budgetary practice. Um, we actually raised taxes, just to uh, refer to the panel before us, uh, by a bit, in defiance of all public opinion polls that said that every job would move from New York to a uh, cheaper tax zone, but in fact, we found that most people really wanted to stay in New York and uh, corporate life thrived here because people really respected more quality of life uh, and the wonderful things that New York had to offer in culture and in other areas in education uh, over taxes. They privileged quality of life over taxes. Uh, we innovated in education, health, housing, community development, social welfare, transportation, real estate, zoning. I'm, I would argue that the city today is a far better place to live and work and raise a family. Um, the, and that is, of course, the heart of what we saw as government's obligation um, to its citizens, the heart of the enterprise itself. Uh, our fundamental dedication was to advancing opportunity, equality, and social justice. We were, after all, children of the 1960s, raised on the idealism of John Kennedy, the feminism of Betty Friedan and Gloria Steinem the iconoclasm of cultural icons like the Beatles, and so now you have the first time you've ever been to a policy conference where two speakers have raised John Lennon. Um, but, and this is the point I want to make, and, and this redresses, I think, the one oversight I felt in some of the earlier panels, and that was lack of reference to gender. No was, nowhere was our sense of possibility 30 years ago greater than in the landmark policies and programs we use government to build for women and families uh, where there had simply never been any before. Or very, there were few, I shouldn't say any, because obviously there were some. Um, but we were among the first women who'd ever held public office and we sensed a special obligation because of this. And so we helped, just to name a few, build a vast network of community-based neighborhood health care centers across the city, which are now the model for the $12 billion um, that uh, is in the Affordable Care Act for neighborhood health care centers. Uh, these included maternal and child health and the first federally funded family planning programs for poor working women. We passed domestic violence laws and opened shelters for battered women and instituted programs to train police uh, and the criminal justice professionals to recognize abuse and take it seriously. 
We fought for pregnancy leaves for women in the public and private sectors when we ourselves were having uh, babies on vacation time, and I can happily say that one of those babies just had a baby of her own with a three-month leave guaranteed by the federal government's Family and Medical Leave Act. We overcame considerable church resistance and introduced programs in our schools for pregnant women um, so they could return to school, and we expanded daycare for their children. Uh, we went to Albany to ensure that the state would pay for abortions for poor women when Washington refused to do so. On a perhaps less noble but still important note, we even brought suit against all the elite social clubs in town that would not admit professional women, and we won when it became clear under Title VII that these that businesses were paying the membership dues for these clubs and in effect discriminate against women by denying them access to dining rooms and sports facilities where important um, professional relationships are, are built. And so I say this all and I say it passionately because uh, of course across the country at that time profound shifts in the economy were propelling women into the workforce and uh, as I mentioned in my reference to Betty and, and, and Gloria, powerful second wave of women's rights advocates were driving necessary changes in cultural norms. But not much would have happened without the powerful influence of government. Whatever the larger trends at play, uh, my point in highlighting my own personal experiences uh, is that uh, whether it's women or just about anybody else, um, change doesn't happen without the full force of legal and, and policy instruments uh, driven by determined advocates both inside and outside government, nationally and locally, and that's the message of our conference today, and so I wanted to open with my own little biographical statement. We have a rich panel. Uh, we're gonna begin with my uh, colleague at the Roosevelt Institute, Dorian Warren, who's also uh, a colleague in terms of Columbia Connections, a professor of political science and public policy at SIPA, uh, and he's gonna speak a little bit about the history of labor and um, government's relationships in uh, bringing about social justice. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. I know we're a little sleepy right now. We have one too many cookies. So I want to pick up and challenge a bit the first panel, which was an excellent panel in lots of ways. But I want to make the argument that you can't understand the historic role of government without understanding how issues of race and labor are central to the role, the use, and the conflicts over the federal government throughout American political history and American political development. So I want to first turn to a campaign launched by progressive reformers at the turn of the 20th century who wanted to pass a piece of national legislation that would ban what I'll just refer to as an egregious injustice in this country. Some of you probably know what this is already. Don't say it yet. <laughs> so these reformers and, and labor advocates attempted at both the state and the national level throughout the 19th century. They were successful at the state level early on. As early as 1879, Massachusetts was the first state to pass progressive legislation eliminating this unjust practice. <coughs> New York soon followed. By 1899, 28 states had passed some reform legislation addressing this horrible practice. But reformers then turned their attention to the national level. And building from these state victories, their assumption was that the morality of the policy was so right, it'd be very easy to pass national legislation. So the first national legislation to ban this practice was introduced in 1906. It failed. A second attempt, the Palmer Owen Act, failed to pass Congress in 1914. Congress then finally passed a law in 1916 to address this issue, the Owen Keating Act. Success, maybe, but the Supreme Court strikes it down two years later in 1918 as unconstitutional. Sound familiar? Congress tried again in 1918, and again the Supreme Court struck this piece of legislation down as unconstitutional in 1922. Defeated twice now by the Supreme Court of the United States, the advocates get the Senate to pass a constitutional amendment in 1924 to address this issue, yet not enough states ratified the amendment. By introduced in 1924, but by 1933, 35 states had considered this constitutional amendment and rejected it. Only six passed this amendment. And it's not until the late 1930s 
when Congress passes a seminal piece of New Deal legislation, which ultimately does pass constitutional muster. Okay, so what's this issue I'm talking about? Fair labor standards. Child labor. Child labor. So the fight to end child labor, I think, is reflective of other 20th century federal policies that advance social justice. And so as you see here, the 1938 Fair Labor Standard, Standards Act, which for the first time gave us a minimum wage and eliminated child labor on the national level, was part and parcel of a package of policies aimed at per advancing economic justice. So we have the 1935 Wagner Act, we have the 1935 Social Security Act, and of course the FLSA. The Wagner Act in particular, after decades in which the doctrine of what was called criminal conspiracy denied workers the right to organize, as well as decades of failed attempts in the 19th century to reform those criminal conspiracy laws, the Wagner Act finally gives workers the right to organize in the private sector for the first time outside of wartime. And I want to emphasize something here. As, as much as we hail the Wagner Act, the Social Security Act, the Fair Labor Standards Act, I want to emphasize that all three of these pieces of progressive legislation were racially exclusive. This was the compromise with Southern Democrats around keeping the Southern racial and economic caste system in place. And the price of passing progressive legislation was were occupational exclusions of domestic and agricultural workers, which was the race neutral way to essentially exclude blacks who were concentrated still in the South. Okay, and then we have another big burst of federal progressive legislation with the Civil Rights Reform Era and the Great Society, so the Civil, 1964 Civil Rights Act, 1964 the launch of the War on Poverty, the 65 Voting Rights Act, 68 Fair Housing Act, OSHA even I've thrown in there. These are just reflective, there are lots more I could, I could include here. But the point I wanna make here is that there were several piecemeal state efforts to deal with racial inequality in employment, to deal with voting rights issues. And we see a pattern similar in the 1960s that we see 100 years before. That is, the second reconstruction of the 1960s required the federal government to intervene to tackle the unjust racial caste system of Jim Crow, similar to how the first reconstruction after the Civil War required, required the federal government ultimately to intervene. And obviously, we fought a war over the role ultimately of the federal government and the power of the federal government over what states could and could not do. And this is an issue we've been debating, the role of the national government since the founding. And again, I can't emphasize enough how much race and labor were central, have been central to this long-standing conflict throughout American political history. Indeed, we can't understand contemporary debates about states' rights versus federal intervention, whether it's voter suppression, whether it's reproductive freedom, or marriage equality without understanding this historical context. Advocates of social justice have always looked to the federal government for laws or even sometimes constitutional amendments to advance their causes. Now the role of the federal government as a critical lever for racial justice didn't end with the post-Civil War Reconstruction efforts. Obviously, as I just explained, it continued well into the 20th century. And the road to racial equality and justice, as one case, has been what uh, Roger Smith and Phil Klinkner call the unsteady march. It hasn't been always a forward march to racial and social justice. The federal government, in fact, has often been hesitant to intervene and it's often taken extraordinary conditions. Essentially, it's taken social movements for many of the biggest gains. Normal incremental politics is often not enough to get federal government intervention on questions of inequality in this country. So simply put, if you can remember one thing from my presentation, federal government intervention has been a necessary condition for racial inclusion, for gender inclusion and for social justice, including economic justice throughout American political history. Now this chart I've thrown up is a chart of Section 5 preclearance states. These are states that were covered under the Voting Rights Act of 1965 
that required what's called preclearance, meaning because of their history of white supremacy, these southern states which excluded blacks from voting through 1965, any time they wanted to change their voting system, they had to be pre-cleared by the Justice Department, uh, either making changes to congressional districts in the redistricting process or any kind of other voting changes. And I threw this map up because it's so similar to this map, right? But also because, and keep this geographic pattern in mind, also because the geographic pattern is similar throughout history in terms of where the most amount of inequality persists in American democracy. It's often in the old Confederate states and on a range of dimensions, whether we look at gender or class or a range of dimensions, it's often the Confederate states that are the leaders in inequality and that often require federal intervention to equalize outcomes. Essentially, but for the federal government, there would be a hodgepodge of unequal states, unequal laws around voting rights, which I'm going to come back to because there they're, they're ultimately continue to be unequal laws around voting rights. But at least with the 65 Voting Rights Act, but for federal government intervention, we continue to have the old school Jim Crow hodgepodge of, of exclusion and unequal voting rights. So let me turn to a contemporary example of the hodgepodge of state laws that end up increasing inequality. So this is a chart from 09 that looks at union membership by states. And as you can see, in this case, the states with the darker shading have the highest rates of union membership. States with the lighter shadings have the lowest rates of union membership. Again, notice the pattern of the old Confederate states there. Essentially, the 1947 Taft-Hartley Act, which was the backlash to the National Labor Relations Act, allowed, as we know, so-called right-to-work states. Right-to-work states make it very difficult to maintain union membership. And there's a relationship between right-to-work states, low union membership, and inequality. So I want to show you that pattern, that geographic pattern of where union strength and weakness maps onto broader trends in income inequality. Actually, I want to show you two maps. So here's the map of the, we might think of this as the influence of Taft-Hartley on the geographic decline of the labor movement over time. So you start from 64 and it runs up to 2005. And you see all across the country there's been a decline in union membership, but it's been especially pronounced in the southern right-to-work states. And of course, my argument here is that this is linked to patterns of inequality by region and geography. So even when you control for other factors, union percentage, union membership is decisive in terms of levels of inequality in this country. And, the, and these unequal outcomes, if we get the updated map from with 2010 data, I think this would be magnified, actually. So, what we see here, this pattern of inequality by geography and region, this is a result of failures of the national government to either repeal Taft-Hartley, or more recently, to simply reform and update our labor laws so we have one national standard and framework for how, you, how people can join unions, much like we have one national standard and framework when it comes to almost every other employment law, anti-discrimination laws or wage and hour laws, states can go up above and beyond the federal government, but we don't have the same hodgepodge of standards when it comes to employment laws in the same way we do with labor law. Now I think you can see the result of the retreat from the, uh, you can see the result of the federal government's retreat from issues of economic justice and economic security over the last 30 to 40 years, much of what was talked about in the first panel this morning with this chart. So this is a look at the declining mobility in the US from the 1950s through the year 2000. And essentially this shows that a child born today is much more likely to inherit his or her, her parents' income status relative to the immediate post-war years. So we're a much less mobile country as a result of the retreat of the federal government in advancing economic justice. 
And I want to highlight the continuing role of the federal government in advancing, I want to go back to racial justice for a minute, by looking at the interaction of the rise of mass incarceration and state voting laws. So yet another map, yet another similar pattern of southern confederate states relative to the rest of the country. So my generation is essentially the most incarcerated generation in American history. It's also the most incarcerated generation on the planet. The U.S. has 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's prisoners. We are the world leaders in incarcerating citizens, and not just citizens, incarcerating people. And the point I want to make here is that incarceration is a political project. Relatively little of it has to do with objective crime rates. And it's been a political project over the last 30 years that has severe consequences especially when there's a lack of federal government intervention to deal with this question. So here then is a map of black disenfranchisement. This is again from the year 2000, so a bit dated. You can imagine these numbers are worse today. These are percentages of black voting age populations that are permanently disenfranchised because of a criminal record, because of a felony. So look here at Florida, 16%, Virginia, Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, and ask yourself the question, and there have been some social scientists that have asked this question, do these, do felony disenfranchisement laws, which are still in the books in lots of states around the country, they're actually a relic from <coughs> the end of the 19th century, they're a response to the federal government leaving the South as a result of Southern redemption, and this was the Southern response to reconstruction to pass these kinds of laws to disenfranchise the newly enfranchised black slaves, former slaves, I should say. So do these laws still on the books matter today? And the question is yes, they matter when you, when you combine them or when they interact with the rise in mass incarceration the last 30 to 40 years. So by one estimate, just in the year 2000, the disenfranchisement of the black voting age population likely affected the 2000 presidential election in some obvious ways we might remember, especially in Florida. And it also affected in that year, the um, social scientists estimate seven US Senate elections that were very close. So just in the year 2000, seven Senate seats were hinged on disenfranchisement of black votes. Again, if you look at the history of felon disenfranchisement laws, it was southern states using the argument of states' rights after the first reconstruction that led this effort to disenfranchise the newly enfranchised black vote guaranteed by the 15th Amendment, again, by essentially national or federal government intervention. So let's bring this up to date and look at current efforts at voter disenfranchisement, which is now widespread. These are the equivalent of 21st century say grandfather clauses or poll taxes. These are a range of these voter ID laws that have been passed or are pending in several states. And you might ask yourself, well, what's, what's the point he's trying to make here? The argument here is that the rise of mass incarceration of millions of Americans, especially of black and Latino Americans, combined with felony disenfranchisement and voter suppression is ultimately an outcome from lack of federal government involvement. So I'm actually making an argument of the, the reverse of the title of a panel. What happens when the federal government does not get involved? Inequality increases in a range of domains. Essentially, we have 50 different voting systems and laws in this country. And many of the rhetorical and ideological justification for legislation at the state level, again, is the argument of states' rights. And I want to return to that point in my conclusion. So quickly, just in terms of economic inequality, I wanted to give you a quick snapshot. We've already heard today and we know already the role of the top 1% in taking a greater share of national income the last 30 years. Conserv conservative government has played a role in that process and this is just simply one example of the role of deregulation by the national government as one of several factors that leads to greater economic inequality and I think Lane is going to talk much more about what government can do to reverse this trend in his presentation. But I just wanted to suggest again what happens when government 
the national government either does not get involved or in this case actually deregulates. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, two more slides, as I mentioned earlier, it's often taken extraordinary measures or conditions to achieve social justice of all kinds. And one of the biggest obstacles over time has been the filibuster in the Senate. The filibuster was used, as you know, to block civil rights legislation throughout the late 1950s and ultimately to water down much of the legislation that ultimately passed in the early 1960s. I think it's been the single most important obstacle blocking labor law reform in the last 40 years. And in fact, there's an interesting irony here. Senator Everett Dirksen from my home state of Illinois was critical as a moderate Republican at ending the filibuster over the 1964 Civil Rights Act. It's a very well-known story and he's revered in many ways for negotiating this compromise around the 64 Civil Rights Act and ending that filibuster. But then he himself sustained a filibuster on labor law reform throughout 1965 and 1966, which was one of four attempts in the last 40 years to reform labor law. It was Dirksen himself that sustained the filibuster blocking efforts to repeal Taft-Hartley, in, in fact, as well as update our labor laws. Anyhow, as you can see by this chart, the use of the filibuster is getting worse. There are lots of obstacles that we can talk about in terms of rediscovering government or redirecting government toward the pursuit of social justice. There's rhetoric and narrative, which you heard about this morning. There's the, there are issues of capacity and the perceptions of failure, as Jill Sauce talked about. There's this issue of Americans not knowing what government does, the reference to this great new book by Suzanne Mettler called The Submerged State. I want to add another obstacle, and that's an institutional obstacle. The filibuster is that obstacle where it takes super majorities to advance progressive policies in this day and age. Okay, final point. We should think of all, we should think about all of this, the role of race, the role of labor, the role of gender, as shaping the ways in which government is used to pursue both inequality in some cases, but also social justice. The reality is that but for government intervention from the post-Civil War era throughout the 20th century, but for federal government intervention, even most recently to health care reform, we'd be a much more radically unequal country. Thank you. Well, thanks to Dorian for that extraordinarily uh, concise and uh, thoughtful presentation. Uh, on to the rich other members of our panel. Um, right here from uh, the New School, head of what do you call it, SEPA, a different kind of SEPA yeah, um, than Columbia SEPA, the uh, Schwartz Center for Economic Policy. Uh, Teresa Gilarducci, a labor economist. Um, you have her distinguished bio uh, in your folder, so I won't go through it all, other than to say that um, she's gonna speak about Social Security. Yes, thanks, um, and I was not here this morning. I was in an airport, and I want to formally Again, welcome you to the New School and to, um, to the Sports Center for Economic Policy Analysis. Um, so we did coordinate our, uh, our, um, our talk, and I'm going to speak as an economist and talk about the ways that economists talk about the role of government. One is that um, we uh, view government as essential for um, ensuring inalienable rights, the kinds of issues uh, on women's rights and, um, and racial rights and civil rights um, that were just talked about um, by Ellen and by Dorian. Um, we also have this view that, that, government, that um, governments help um, redistribute income on the edges after the market has done its work. So we take aftermarket um, incomes and redistribute that. Lane will be talking a lot about um, how that's gone. And there's another kind of new um, idea about what government can do for the market that's exploding, and I want to finish with that. And this is the idea that we really abandoned the New Deal way of thinking about um, government's role in the market <coughs> and embrace a kind of libertarian paternalism. Um, this idea um, came out of the University of Chicago by Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein in their book called Nudge and their notion that you can actually um, solve very large social problems with little small changes in the social architecture came out of Chicago and went to Washington. 
uh, along with our President Obama. And it's very important for us to, to conceive that as a new way of thinking about the role of government that I'm going to say won't work and is very expensive. And uh, so that's where I'm, I'm going to end. Um, so I, when um, Jeff and I um, first talked about this conference, and well, Jeff you know, proposed this conference and envisioned it, uh, we had this great conversation with Rick McGahee and Jeff and, and I, and we just um, went on for hours. And he said, damn it, the government's not there to correct market failures. The market is a failure. <laughs> and um, that's a, a very important point, that um, part of a modern uh, market economy is envisioned, is um, necessary to have a strong government. It's not just to assign property rights. There's a lot more that the government has to do to make the market work. The government um, is, in, is embedded in the market. So let me just take an obvious um, problem um, that was addressed in the New Deal and is still being addressed, and that is that um, human beings, when they're subjected to a market economy, are also subjected to the risk of losing income because they can no longer participate in the market economy. This is what our friend from the World Bank talked about um, is con uh, concomitant with the market is the role of social insurance. So here I'm giving you some data that's fresh off um, our computer um, that projects out what these populations by age are their risk that they're facing of being poor or near poor, officially near poor is practically poor, um, in, the, in, the coming, in the coming years. So folks who are about ready to retire, their um, chance of being poor is 31%. Mind you, the current poverty statistics are 8% if you um, use a real poverty figure, a near poor figure, twice the poverty rate, it's about 18%. So we're predicting for these near retirees almost a 50% increase in their poverty rates. And for middle-aged workers, those rates are going to go up, and for younger workers, those rates are going to go up even more. And the reason is because over the past 30 years, we've experimented with changing that social insurance uh, program and replacing it with a market-based retirement system. Um, the traditional plans and the expansion of Social Security stopped 30 years ago, and we replaced it with do-it-yourself pensions, where workers, for the first time, are exposed to risk to the market and exposed to the risk of not accumulating enough, enough income and exposed to the risk of living too long. And so look again at this chart. I haven't broken it down by income because um, every, in, every, every person in every income group and those, age, and those age groups are subject to a certain kind of retirement risk. If you're poor in those age groups, you suffer from the age-old problem, no pun intended, um, the consistent problem of just not having enough income, not having enough savings, and not having enough income when you um, retire. No big deal there, except we had a social security system with a minimum benefit requirement that actually was a very poverty-eliminating um, program. Those expansions stopped. 30 years ago. We also have middle class workers who now exposed to these do-it-yourself pension plans have to, are now exposed to the risk of not accumulating enough, not picking the right investment, retiring at the wrong time uh, when the market goes down, and also exposed to longevity risk. If you're the higher income group in any of those age groups, you may have uh, not, you don't face the risk of not accumulating enough. You had enough money, you saved enough. And perhaps you had really good investment um, advice and a little bit of luck, and you invested enough. But you're very worried about living too long. So at every income group, uh, people are exposed to more risk um, in their old age than they ever have before. And it's because of the increased um, incursion of the market in this area. Now, that's the bad news. I want us to put on our party hats for a moment, because there's something to celebrate. Um, this is really just echoes Dorian's, sorry, Dorian's um, um, narrative, which is this very long history of government um, becoming involved in social justice. I'm narrowing it to talk about just um, social justice to older people, but I am here to celebrate that it worked, that the co combination of the National Labor Relations Act and collective bargaining and social security meant that in this country, 
we redistributed retirement time in a way that historians from 60 years ago probably never imagined would happen. So I'm going to show you something that I really want us to celebrate, which is if we look beyond distribution, beyond risk, and beyond income, or even wealth, and just look at it in the most basic way you can think of when you're old. What's most precious to you? That which is scarce, and that's time. In this country, we have built a retirement system, Social Security with an employer pension, a little bit of savings on the top, that equalize retirement time. In a way, when I looked at the data for the first time, I really thought something was wrong. I looked at the outliers, I re-ran it, I, I changed the categories, and this is what I found. You don't see this kind of distribution in any other indicator. Wealth, income, risk, housing, voting, incarceration. You don't see that the bottom 20%, look at, look at the men, have almost 20% of retirement time. They have 17%. The very highest income men, the 20% uh, with the highest income, they have a little bit more retirement time. They have 22%. But 17, 22% is almost perfect equality. Perfect equality would be that at any income level, everybody got the same percentage as they represent in the population of that thing. That thing here is retirement time. So conceptually what it is, is I took a sample of people surveyed by the University of Michigan in the Health and Retirement Survey, um, watched when they retired in my data set, it's a 20 year uh, panel data set, um, and I watched when they retired or took disability and um, watched them until they died. So I gathered up all those folks, cut it this way by income, I cut it by race, and I found that of the total pie of retirement time, it was distributed practically equally. Well, those are my folks that were retired and retired and died in 1990 to um, 2000. Okay, that, is, that distribution is going to look very different because of the graph I just showed you. This is a celebration. We did something right. Not only does Social Security let people retire at 62, for people, I just met someone who worked um, in an auto factory at 18 and retired at 30. Okay, 30 years of retirement time because he didn't go to college or graduate school or, or found different kinds of jobs. Most careers are about 40 years long. So 30 years in an auto factory is enough for blue collar. He got to retire early. This um, uh, research on traditional plans, defined benefit plans, show that those kinds of plans let people retire before 62 and they're very much associated with jobs that require a lot of physical labor and other kinds of depreciation of, of, <coughs> of human capital. So defined benefit plans that allow early retirement, meaning before the Social Security early retirement age, and allow disability, which Social Security does, on top of a system that actually allows people with age discrimination laws that if you started your adult life at 27 after graduate school and you really have to start working for a living, that you live a little bit longer, that it equalizes those class and racial differences. If I cut it by race, you would find the same kinds of distribution. So I'm broadening this definition of distribution by just looking at time. That's what I've done here. Um, the other role of government, it was talked about in Robert Frank's book, The Winner Take All Society, where in a, a couple of pages, he actually exploded this concept that Social Security does more than just this. It also um, allows people to get out, get, um, get away from what Thorsten Veblen, who taught here at the New School, again, thank you for being here, that people are human beings and they engage in, um, in inconspicuous consumption in order to place themselves in a hierarchy. This is all familiar to you. Um, and um, we can't help it in every culture's um, we see that people try to, um, try to exhibit their, um, their place in that hierarchy. That means that we overconsume visible or status goods and we underconsume goods that may be good for us but that it doesn't help us place ourselves in a, in a hierarchy. Savings for your retirement is one of those dull um, goods. Nobody knows how much you have and you really have a lot of incentives not to consume much of it. So Social Security overcomes that and makes you save. It's mandatory savings. 
boy, these familiar, these arguments are really familiar given the Supreme Court hearings. Um, there was no constitutional, um, serious constitutional um, challenge to this mandatory social insurance because they called it a tax. <laughs> it's a FICA tax. But uh, there's another reason why I put this um, up in front of you. I only have four slides and I use one of my precious ones for this slide, is look at the dates. 1940-1950, we um, raised the tax by 100%. From 1960 to 1970, the tax increased. From 1970 to 1980, the tax increased. Look what's happened in the last 22 years, nothing. There's been no expansion of taxes for this important um, piece of social insurance. Um, so we were, re we're due for an, an expansion of Social Security. I, there was an article about my plan to expand Social Security buried in the business section of the New York Times yesterday. Um, one point is that I think it can happen at the state level, if it won't happen at the federal level, it really doesn't matter. We need to supplement Social Security with uh, mandatory savings. Um, I just, I'll use my remaining time to talk about the other, the competing response um, to this growing problem of retirement insecurity. And that's a response that comes from Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein which most of their research was done in the retirement area, which is, hey, they say, we don't need more Social Security or a mandate to save more. We actually can um, get that by changing 401k rules. Have people opt in, and then the, um, um, the inertia will make them stay in. So these little tiny uh, voluntary changes are supposed to actually solve this massive retirement crisis. Um, and that seemed to be libertarian, hands off, just the government being cute. A lot of this research was based on getting men to eat more vegetables, and there was, there was a lot of serious research done on if you put apples near the beer, there was a greater <laughs> consumption in, um, um, in vegetables for a certain um, group. My point here in this slide is that this voluntary social insurance has a lot of hidden costs. That if you want to make it voluntary, you have to incent it. And the way that our country incentivizes or, or actually uses government funds to get to meet social policy is through the back door with these tax expenditures. We're off the charts in terms of other countries doing that. So we get a lot of our social policy through tax breaks, clever as they are, and the expenditure of the federal government spending in terms of tax expenditure is quite high in this area. So libertarian paternalism is much more expensive than mandated um, social security increases. Add that to all the advertising costs that you see in Charles Schwab and Fidelity and all those clever ads encouraging you to retire, that, um, and to save for retirement, that's been going on for 30 years and the coverage rates and the poverty um, projections have only got, gotten up. So here's the cost of, volunteer, of voluntarism or hands-off government. There are huge social, usual, huge tax expenditures, which have gone up far more than any discretionary uh, payment to anti-poverty or even to the military, because they're never debated in Congress. So I'll close there to talk about this, to, to say that a direction towards more tax breaks or more incentivization or more cute ways to change rules are not going to solve our biggest social problems. And the one that I chose to use an example is the coming retirement crisis. Thanks. Okay, this is an awful lot of information, but fascinating. Um, I think we should go to the third paper and leave all questions for the end, although I'm tempted to stop, and, but I, I, I don't think it's fair to Lane. So Lane Kenworthy, um, professor of sociology and political science at the University of Arizona, studies the causes and consequences of living standards, poverty, inequality, mobility, employment, economic growth, et cetera. And I, I can tell you what's really going to be wonderful about this is we're going to look at the United States comparatively in the rest of the world, and that's a subject dear to my heart, and I think really uh, all the more important in terms of understanding where we've fallen behind as a government. So thanks very much. Um, I think I'm maybe the 15th or so speaker today, so I'll try my best to hold your attention for 15 more minutes. 
not not a few seconds more than that, just 15, and I'll, I'll try to end promptly, or, or as best I can. <laughs> so uh, this is a nice quote that I like from our, our conference organizer, Jeff Matter. It's, it's not uh, necessarily meant to apply to the specific issue or problem that I'm going to be talking about, but I think it captures uh, more or less exactly what I think, uh, and I, I hope I'll, you'll be able to see why as I as I go through this. Okay, so here's the particular problem that I'm going to talk about. Uh, different speakers today have looked at different aspects of uh, this problem, and here on this panel, especially, where we've been looking at uh, just a, a very thin slice or small smattering of the problems that exist, the social problems, social economic problems that exist in the society that we might think that we could do better on and government might be able to help somewhat with. Here's the one I'm going to focus on. And this is the divorce between growth of the economy and growth of household incomes in the lower half of the distribution. Uh, this is just one way to show this, but I, I kind of like it. So um, we have data on, there are two dark lines here. One is GDP per capita, that's a, a dashed line. And we have data on that going back even further, actually, but good data since right after World War II. We also have data on median family income, which is not terribly good data pre-tax. Family is not really the right unit that you want to study, but it's not bad, and in any event, we have data going back a long time. And the, the point is that from roughly the end of World War II up through some point in the 1970s, these two things moved more or less in sync. It doesn't have to be that way, but it was a nice thing. Um, and, and this is just one way of showing the fact that uh, uh, economic growth was pretty nicely spread out among the American population. It actually grew just as rapidly, in fact, if you look lower in the income distribution. Since then, that hasn't been the case. Uh, per capita gross domestic product has continued to grow relatively quickly, not quite as quickly as in the 50s and 60s, but quickly enough. But household incomes from the median on down uh, have not. There are much better data that we can look to now. The Congressional Budget Office has put together a very nice data set that merges uh, uh, household survey information with tax records. Um, and also includes employer benefits and a variety of other things. Uh, and they show essentially the same picture as, as median family income. It's grown much more slowly. So this is what I want to look at. Rising living standards as measured by or proxied by rising incomes and the way that they've grown much more slowly than the economy since the 1970s. Um, so one, th there are a number of questions that can be asked about this, but one, I think, fairly common objection that you hear is that, well, this is just the way things work now. This is a function of the new economy. There are lots of ways in which the economy has changed since the 1950s and 60s. It's much more globalized. It's much more competitive, even in sectors that aren't subject to international competition. Think of retail trade. There was no counterpart to Walmart back in the 1950s and 60s, and, our, and virtually no one would have predicted this but it's made that sector, even though it's not really subject to international competition or to only a very small degree, it's made it highly competitive. Um, we also have a service-based economy uh, rather than a manufacturing. Manufacturing was only at its peak, about a third of all employment, but that was a lot. Um, and we don't have that anymore. And so maybe we're stuck with tons of low-end service jobs and you know wages can't go up and household income can't go up. So there's just no alternative, in other words. Well. One way we can think about assessing this, it's not foolproof, but it's about as good as we can do, is try to, to see what's happened in other fairly similar, not perfectly similar by any stretch, but fairly similar countries. And so that's what I'm going to do here. This, um, this shows per year increase in average income of households in the bottom half of the distribution, so from the median and below in each of these countries. Uh, the data here are from a, a nice comparative data set or database called the Luxembourg Income Study. It's the best that we have for comparing incomes across the rich countries. This is, I think, 17 nations, including us. You can see we're down there at the bottom. Um, the particular years that are available aren't quite the same, and so that's why I put it on a per year basis. And I convert all this. It's adjusted for inflation, of course. I also convert it into American dollars to make it a little easier to see. Uh, using purchasing power parities, which are not perfect, but this, this is as good as we can do. 
Uh, you can see that there's a lot of variation across the countries. It doesn't include the economic crisis that ends about in about the mid-2000s, which is part of the reason Ireland looks so good. Ireland's fallen well back since then. But it really did have this boom period. Um, the point is there's a lot of variation, and we didn't do so well compared to a lot of other rich countries. Well, part of this is just differences in economic growth. But it turns out it's only a, that's only a small part of the story. And in fact, if you take away Ireland and Norway, Norway has a lot of oil. It's a social democratic country, and so if you're inclined to say, well, social democracy is the root not only for equality and low poverty and lots of other good stuff, but also economic growth, you point to Norway. But that's not a, a very honest way of going about it. Um, anyway, if you take away Ireland and Norway, about two-thirds of the variation across these countries owes not to differences in the rate of economic growth, but in the degree to which growth reaches households in the lower half of the distribution. Again, that's what's captured here in this chart that I just showed you for the United States. It's the divorce between economic growth, or decoupling as I've taken to calling it, between economic growth and growth of household incomes in, in the middle and in the, in the lower half. Okay, so uh, here's one way to see this, and I'll show you this for an, uh, a number of countries. Just a very simple chart with years as the data points, and, and the years here are mainly since the 1970s. In this Luxembourg Income Study database, we have uh, uh, data points at about five-year intervals for most of these countries. So think roughly 1980, 85, and so on, up through the mid-2000s. Along the horizontal axis, I'm going to show you a chart like this for each country. I'm not going to take much time with this. Um, along the horizontal axis is GDP per capita. It's going to move to the right in all of these countries to varying degrees because there were some differences in rates of economic growth. But as we move through time, these countries get richer. Their economies grow. Uh, on the vertical axis is, again, household income, average household income for households in the lower half of the distribution. And that's usually going to go up. Now, what we want to see is as countries move to the right, they also move up. I've connected the data points here with lines. We'd like to see a positive slope to that line. That's an indicator of the degree to which economic growth reaches lower half households. You see in Ireland, not only a lot of economic growth, not only does it move very far to the right, again, pre-crash, pre pre-crisis, but also it moves up a lot on the vertical axis. And you see this nice, strong, positive slope to the line. That's a, a good result for a country. Here's what Norway looks like, very similar. Here's the Netherlands. I'm going to breeze through, you, through these. And if, you know, if you happen to be interested uh, in this, I can come back to them later on or send you the slides or something. Here's the UK, uh, a country that might surprise you because it's often uh, uh, put into the same grouping as the US as a sort of failed liberal market economy as compared to political economists sometimes call it. It actually did really well during this uh, period. Uh, mostly, I'll just pause to point out in the period since the mid-1990s different political complexion to the government uh, than there had been in the prior two decades. Um, Belgium looks pretty good. doesn't grow as fast, but again, you see this nice, strong, uh, positive slope to the line. Sweden, similar story. Spain, similar story. Denmark, whoops, Finland, I missed just in case you're interested. I'll stay. France looks pretty good. Again, not a lot of economic growth, although the last data point there is 2000, so it's kind of truncated in terms of the period. Now with Austria, we're going to see some flatter slopes to the line, which again is telling you that less economic growth, however much there was, less of it translated into rising incomes for households at the median and below. Again, this is half the population I'm talking about. I'm not just talking about the poorest. We're not just the middle class, narrowly or broadly defined. I'm talking about the whole lower half of the income distribution in these countries. Australia, much flatter. Italy. Here's the United States. We poke up a little bit in, in this data set. Again, there's about five year, uh, the data points are about five year intervals. And this is entirely, the, the upward movement is entirely in the late 1990s, which those of you who know the story of the American economy for the last 30 years won't be surprised to, uh, to see. Canada, similar. Germany, maybe surprisingly to some of you. And Switzerland, also flat line. So we're not the only country that hasn't done all that well. But it's certainly not the case that economic growth has, has translated into no or only a little bit of, of income growth for households in the lower half if we look across the, the broad sweep of rich countries in the world, at least the ones for which we have data. Now, next question is, why did, of the countries that succeeded, again, that had positive, nice strong positive slopes to these lines, why did they succeed? Well, 
think about uh, how households get income and how it can grow. Two, broadly speaking, two main sources. One is earnings, labor market stuff. Again, this is the bottom half, so the capital gains is irrelevant here for the most part. And you can get some transfers from parents to kids and some other stuff and alimony payments. There are all kinds of sources of income. But basically it's earnings and net government transfers. So benefits you get from government minus any taxes you pay. For earnings can come through wages or hours worked, or employment in other words, wages or employment, or both, ideally. Uh, so in this database, I can break down uh, incomes into these two sources, into earnings and net government transfers. And I'll just show you what this looks like in the United States. And here I've split this bottom half of households into two groups, so the bottom quarter and then the next quarter. Uh, the next quarter is a little closer to the median. With these two broad, broad sources of income, earnings and net government transfers. You can see down at the bottom, of course, the, the two combined are lower. That's why they're in the bottom quarter and they're higher over to the right. Uh, the difference mainly is earnings, although net government transfers, not surprisingly, are a bit higher for poorer households, the bottom quarter of households. Uh, but the key thing here is that neither one moves up. These are flat lines across the whole period, for the most part, a little bit of increase in earnings in the mid to late 1990s. But essentially uh, flat here. Um, here I'll just show you quickly uh, Sweden where you see a little bit of increase in net government transfers in the bottom quarter um, and some earnings uh, as well as a little bit of increase in net government transfers for the, the next quartile. And I'm going to skip through this. I, I have some charts on the UK and Germany and lots of others too, although I didn't include them here, just to go straight to the summary chart. Um, for the bottom quarter, here's the, thank you, here's the, the story. Where uh, household incomes went up, where you saw positive slopes to those lines in the scatter plot charts I showed you a few moments ago, it was mainly not because earnings went up, but because net government transfers increased. Uh, in a few instances, that's actually partly because of tax reductions uh, for people at the low end of the distribution, but mainly it's, it's benefit increases. Benefit increased either explicitly because policymakers sat down and said, oh, maybe we should increase the generosity of our pensions or of our unemployment compensation. Or sometimes uh, because the benefit is structured as a replacement rate and it's pegged to average wages. And when average wages go up, then the benefit increases. And occasionally through other mechanisms. But the point is, so earnings are the, uh, the lighter bars here. Net government transfers are the darker bars. It's net government transfers. It's accounting for most of the increase in the bottom quarter. When you move it to the next quarter, it's more of a mixed story. But here, and this surprised me when I saw it, I, think it was, I thought it was going to be almost all earnings. It's surprising how much of a role net government transfers plays even here. Again, this is from the 25th percentile up to the median. So most people are employed to one degree or another. There are some pensioners, some elderly uh, in this uh, part of the population. But, but not nearly as many as in, the, uh, as in the bottom quarter. And yet here, net government transfers in a number of countries plays an important part of the story. Okay, so I've got just a couple minutes left. I want to say a few things about what I think this implies for the United States going forward. And what I essentially want to, I'm just going to skip to, uh, what I essentially want to say is that we've pinned our hopes uh, explicitly or implicitly, depending on the policymaker, in the last, uh, generation, the last several decades, for rising incomes for lower half households unemployment. We've done very little to increase uh, government benefits. There are a few exceptions uh, to that rule, but broadly speaking, we haven't increased them much uh, so that they, they haven't uh, kept up with the economy, in other words, with economic growth. Um, and also wages haven't uh, increased. In fact, I'll skip to uh, straight to uh, a chart on wages. So this is median earnings of full-time year-round employees. Uh, and if you look lower in the distribution, they're essentially flat as well. Uh, if you look at total compensation, that changes the picture, but only slightly, not a whole lot. The point is that, and this is not unfamiliar to most of you in this room, wages have been flat. Employment has increased. So this is the employment rate for people of, uh, roughly speaking, prime working age, 25 to 64. And we, we achieved some non-trivial employment growth in the 1980s and 1990s. And in fact, uh, more than in some European countries. And this was sort of our one success story in terms of improving living standards relative to Europe, where they had less inequality, less poverty, more generous uh, social insurance systems and safety nets and so on. Uh, but we had a faster growing employment rate than a number of European countries. But in the 2000s, that disappeared. 
in the, even during the upturn of the business cycle, there was there was no net employment growth in uh, from 2000 to 2007. Of course, as you know, uh, things have uh, have fallen a lot since then. Um, we have some room to to make additional progress through adding people to uh, to the workforce, adding if we can solve the problem, of course. But the, the point is that we could get, going forward, we could get more rising living standards, rising incomes through increasing employment. Indeed, uh, to the degree that median household income has increased in the United States in the last generation, it's mainly because that's exactly what's been happening. We've been switching from more uh, households that had, formerly had two adults but only one employed to households with two adults that now have two employed. We have further to go there. We could do more. Whether we will is an open question, given that what's happened not just in the last few years, but really since 2000 now. There's, there's good reason for pessimism. I think there's a lot of reason for, for pessimism about this. Um, there have been a number of changes in our economy. We now have a generation of evidence of no increase in wages in the whole lower half of the wage distribution. Uh, I, I think there's... From my point of view, it's very hard to tell a story about why this would change in coming years. We have one period of mild success, the mid to late 1990s, and I attribute that uh, success to a very low unemployment rate. If we could get back to, let's say, 4.5%, 4% unemployment, maybe we see something similar. Uh, I'm pretty pessimistic about that happening, in part because uh, I, I doubt the Fed's going to make that decision if and when we get near that. I hope I'm wrong. Uh, but I'm, in short, I'm very pessimistic about wages going forward. Um, so what does that leave us? Well, it leaves us what's been the key source, at least in the lower quarter, and, and an important source of household income increase, even above that in a number of other rich countries over the last generation. And that is to say, if the market and the institutions that we have, which is unions and the minimum wage and various other things, haven't been for a generation very successful in boosting household incomes. And there's not a whole lot of reason to think that they're going to be much more successful going forward, that maybe we should think about a compensatory mechanism. One version of this is something like extending the earned income tax rate well up into the middle class. Right now it, it phases out at about 40,000 bucks or so, and it's virtually nothing by the time you get to that. Uh, so if, you're, if your market income, if your pre-tax income is around 40,000 bucks and you have two kids and uh, two adults, you can still get a little bit of money from the EITC, but it's, it's not very much. But we could, this would be quite expensive, but we could extend it much further up into the middle class. And importantly, if we tied it to average wages, not median wage, but average wages, which have continued to go up, it's just that a lot of that goes to, to, or has gone to, to people at the top of the, the wage and earnings distribution, uh, then it would go up steadily uh, over time. Uh, which would be a way of forcing an increase in, uh, in household incomes as the economy goes, presuming the, the economy grows. Now, I know a lot of people don't necessarily like that because it's essentially saying, uh, employers, you're off the hook. It's up to taxpayers now to, uh, to take care of income growth for households in the middle class and below. Um, it's all well and good to think that that's a, a bad outcome, an unfortunate outcome. Uh, but again, if we haven't succeeded in the last 30 years, uh, in doing well, uh, I think we should uh, we should think about alternative mechanisms. However, uh, uh, however much we have to to hold our nose as well, we do that. Uh, I'll stop there. Does anybody want to come up? Uh, do, do you have uh, the ability to sit for a few minutes for questions or? I don't. Yeah, <laughs> okay, and we we we're, we're scheduled for them, but I do feel that we've uh, really. We'll compromise our limit here, on but um, we'll this is 10. such a rich conversation. We'll do 10. Um, are there some questions from the floor to start? Thank you. Say uh, your name and where you're from. All right. Uh, my name is Alex. I'm a. Oh, okay. Um, my name is Alex. I'm. Is this it's, we can hear you, Alex. All right. I'm, <laughs> um, I'm a New York City high school student. It's okay, Helen. <laughs> Sorry. I'm a high school student. I'm a senior right now, and um, I was just wondering, uh, to Professor Morin, your uh, presentation was, I, I enjoyed it very much, but I, I, there's something that I'd like you to elaborate a bit, a bit about. Um, in one of your slides, you showed the income inequality for, thank you, uh, for the nation, and um, New York State was just as dark as a lot of the southern states, and um, 
I was wondering, why is New York such an outlier in this, I guess, data? Because, I mean, New York City is famously, supposedly, an incredibly cosmopolitan place. However, the social and racial inequality is still very present here, just as it is in the South. I mean, you have places like Harlem, the South Bronx, and Bed-Stuy in Brooklyn. And I was just wondering, could you elaborate on why New York is such an outlier in this? Really quick, easy answer to that. Um, the top 1% of New Yorkers took 45% of the income in the last really few years. So the, really. the disparity between the top 1%, literally, when you think of the, the New York being the heart of finance, um, very heavy in terms of other top op occupations, a lot of law firms here, a lot of support services to the financial sector. Because they're taking such a greater share of the city and state income, then the inequality between the top and the bottom is, is just as high here as in southern states. More questions? Uh, Again, say who you are for us. Yes, hi. Ned Hodgman with uh, Understanding Government for um, Professor Gillarducci. I was wondering, you mentioned that um, uh, libertarian paternalism, uh, this is my note here, libertarian paternalism is more expensive than mandated expenditures. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to um, ask you to um, comment on the reality that uh, there are plenty of people who are very happy with that situation. <laughs> That's true. And, That's right. That's good. Uh, and, it's and, just not fair or efficient, but so the efficiency what's the problem? Argument, and that's right. what I was wondering about, whether the efficiency yeah. argument, which is one that um, pro-market conservatives like to right. use and bandy about, is something that can be used uh, essentially against them. Yeah. Um, thanks for asking that, because my last slide got some, a short shrift. Um, so let's just start from the beginning. We do a lot of our social policy through tax deductions. Mm -hmm. um, and in retirement savings, um, they of use of that tax deduction also goes up with income, and the um, tax rate goes up with income. So for two reasons, the tax deduction for retirement savings is much greater for the top 10%, 20% um, than it is for the bottom. For instance, someone who makes over $200,000 a year is going, is going at the 35% tax rate is going to save the maximum. On average, that group, get $7,000 in tax breaks from the federal government for saving the maximum in their 401k. Someone making $20,000 saving the maximum gets nothing. So it's the most lopsided tax expenditure in the um, federal code, and it doesn't, um, in all measures, doesn't seem to incent more savings, that very thing it's supposed to um, incent, because those folks would have saved anyway for their retirement. It's also really expensive. Um, you're giving money to people to incent them to do what they already would do. But on top of that, we have a regulatory system that regulates a voluntary, commercial, um, individually directed retirement accounts. And that takes a lot of advertising costs. And you can see that in the 12B fees um, that are going up. And all lots of and advertising is really dead weight lost. Social Security is not advertised. <laughs> There's no tax incentive for it. It's just. Um, mandated, and it's a lot cheaper, fairer, and more efficient. Jeff? Somebody else. These are three excellent uh, presentations. Thanks very much. I was going to, uh, three excellent uh, presentations, and we uh, say that again. discovering <laughs> government. Uh, thank you. Did I say they were three yeah, you excellent? See you <laughs> <laughs> um, and I was going to ask each of you a question, but let me ask Lane a question. Uh, has corporate governance, especially motivated by Wall Street, uh, uh, Wall Street pressure to increase short-term profits through leverage buyouts, through the, the, the nature of how, how performance is rewarded on Wall Street since the age of Jack Welch, let's say, contributed in your mind to this uh, lack of increase in the median and below median income? Uh, uh, increases in wages, should that be addressed somehow? Mm -hmm. And let me ask you a harder one for most economists. Should trade mm -hmm. issues be addressed in trying to uh, raise median and lower incomes? Um, yeah, I, so I think, I think corporate governance is very much implicated in this. So I, the, the story that I uh, have settled on about why 
wage patterns have been so different in the period since the mid-1970s compared to the 50s and 60s is essentially this. I think there were three very important um, features of the institutional framework in the, the sometimes called the golden age period that then disappeared. So one was limited competition facing a lot of American firms. There was always competition, but it was limited. Um, uh, the second was that shareholders didn't demand constant improvement in profits and quarterly performance. They were satisfied with some slow appreciation in the stock price and dividends. Um, and then the third was unions. Unions were strong enough to force companies who had some slack because the competition was limited and shareholders weren't breathing down their neck to dole out a decent chunk of it in, in regular wage increases. They disappeared. Add on top of that a slew of other things that have changed, you know, beginning roughly speaking in the 70s. Uh, technological advance, globalization, uh, uh, an increase in low-skill immigration, a flatlining of the minimum wage, and there are several others. So this, this, uh, this development is in some ways way over-determined, but I've, I've, that is to say there are an awful lot of things that can, have contributed to it, but I do think changes in corporate governance are a key part of the story. And of course, stagnant wages are a key part of the reason for very slow increase in household incomes. Um, should it be addressed? Uh, I, I think that depends on whether you think we could and, and how we would do it. Uh, I favor doing that. Um, when you ask about trade, uh, again, I think that comes down to the question of how you would do it, how effective that would be, and whether you think it's the right thing to do. Uh, I lean very strongly against focusing on trade as a, a source of trying to address the wage problem because I like the fact that uh, wages and household incomes are going up in places like China and India, and I don't want to see that slow down. And I, for me, from a normative perspective, I don't want an improvement of wages here in the United States, which I very, do much, very much do want, to come at the expense of people in other countries. Of course, there's a debate about the degree to which that would be the case, but that's where I come down on that particular issue. I think we ought to try to tackle it in lots of other ways first and put, put that a, a distant second or third or fourth or eighth. Hillary Darrow? Oh, no, I think have time for one more question. Oh, time for one more question. Uh, Georgia, I'm sorry. My question is about the, the applicability and the relevance of some of the cross, the comparative national data about some of the OEC developed countries um, and their willingness and appetite to have broad and generous social benefits um, sort of overlapped on, on some of the maps that Dorian put up about sort of our, our the, the legacy of our complex racial history and sort of the heterogeneity yeah. of our populations. And I guess one question I have about some of the wealthier European countries is have they become less generous in their, or in their, or is their appetite for benefits lessened as they have had more of an influx of non-European immigration to those countries? And, and the, the flip side maybe is sort of has the stagnation of our um, income in the U.S. so broad-based now and sort of so perhaps lacking a racial element that, uh, in other words, the suffering is so much that we can apply those more. I guess, so the, it's the racial, the racial applicability or question. I would add gender too, because the, the, if, you, if, if I can, uh, because the, 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 the real change in the workforce since the 1970s is a gender change. I mean, we are now close to 50% uh, female through the life cycle as opposed to, what was it, 28 or 29% in 1970. So of the workforce, less than a third was women. So is there a gender factor in <coughs> the flattening out of wages uh, because women earn less? I mean, ob obviously men's wages haven't risen either, but overall, does women's wage depress the total? <laughs> and does, oh, and one other question, if I, if, do, mm -hmm. does the fact that we have to, I mean, this is amazing for me to say because I, of course I support this, but do, is the fact that there are two incomes in households what keeps the lid on social unrest? Um. I'll take I'll take a stab. This is a lot of questions. Um, let me let me say very quickly at the you know the risk of <laughs> being too simple. Um, I suspect that uh, <laughs> being too brief. I, let me put it that way. Um, I suspect that the flood of women into the labor market has ha had a little bit of an effect on wages, but it's it's trivially small. Um, and now because uh, I mean already by 1991 or two. Uh, female college completion outpaced 
male college completion, and there's now as big a gap in favor of women as there was in favor of men back at half a century ago in 1960. So in terms of skill, I mean, if, you, if, if this was a real causal process, you'd expect to work because there's a flood of low-skilled women into the labor market. I mean. There probably was in the 60s and 70s, but not so much anymore. Um, has the rise in household income because of adding a second earner um, reduce the concern or frustration that Americans have about the state of our economy in the last 30 years? I think absolutely yes. And I also think it's really important to take into account the fact that a lot of this shift has been voluntary and desired. It's not simply the case that a lot of households uh, or couples have sat around puzzling their finances and said, oh my gosh, you know, our income hasn't increased, we're at the median or below in the last 10 years, honey, you better get in the labor market. Women have wanted to, to, to get into the labor market. Um, and so in many respects, this part of it at least is a, is a good thing and not to be knocked or, or dismissed uh, or, or so much fretted over. But the short answer to the question is, is I think, uh, yeah, very much. It's, and, and we could go further uh, again, but there is a, there's an upper limit to this. So prime age male uh, labor force participation is on the order of 85, 90%. For women, it's lower than that. I can't remember what the figure is. Let's say it's 70, yeah, some 70 to 75 percent. So we could go higher, and you know, I imagine we will. But there comes a certain point in the society where every two adult household has both people in the labor force, and then you get no more rise in household incomes over time from adding more employment. So you got to have wages, or you got to have something else. I'm really pessimistic about wages. That's why I think we should increasingly think about the, the something else. And to come back to the original question, I think this is, this is a question about whether growing diversity in populations in what formerly were hom very homogenous northern European countries is going to reduce their appetite or embrace of generous welfare states. I think it's an open question, too soon to tell, because a lot of this uh, increase in immigration has been fairly recent in these countries, but we have some interesting, I, so I, I don't think we know yet, but we have some interesting experiments going forward and a great, uh, a great contrast or comparison to keep your eye on is Sweden and Denmark. Denmark's been very closed, hasn't allowed many immigrants in, Sweden has a allowed quite a, a lot. Sweden now has as large a foreign born share of its population as we do, it's about 13% or so. That's all happened in the last 20 years, so we'll see. If, if that hypothesis is correct, you should see Sweden cutting back sharply in, uh, in coming years and Denmark not. I, I, I'm hopeful that that won't happen. Uh, one more question? Can, or can I just respond quickly yeah, to that question? Yes. And that is, um, there, are, there are existing cross-national studies that do show a relationship between ethnic or racial heterogeneity and the likelihood of redistribution. So the higher the level of ethnic and racial heterogeneity in a society, the less likely that country is to redistribute and to have a strong social safety net. This is from, there's a book on this by uh, Glazier, Alicina. Thank, right, thank you. I think that's the best evidence we have. And they compare the US to Western European countries and they show that relationship. And they also show that um, uh, not all ethnic factorizations are equal. That's the right. Race in the South that's right. Is Yes. Right. Right. Okay. Well, thanks to our excellent present presenters. Thank you all, and thank you for Jeff has some closing uh, remarks, so, I yeah. think. I'm a shy to have some closing yeah. remarks, yeah. Which, is really which are by and large to thank you all for staying here. I want to thank our panelists, especially the last panel, who had to wait it out. Uh, many of you I see in the audience sat here in rapt attention for hours and hours. Uh, and we really appreciate that. I do want to say one quick thing about gender, Ellen, because Peter Lindert actually, as part of his book, and, and Lane, Peter Lindert points out that uh, uh, family leave policies in Europe that enable women to enter the labor force and maintain their careers, he believes, has a lot to do with Creating, uh, creating prosperity and yes. ongoing income growth in Europe. Uh, and that accounts for why the welfare state doesn't necessarily undermine growth, but indeed yeah, may at so. least be uh, making it. And easy. also so that's human important. happiness and satisfaction. <laughs> so uh, in any case, do I have any other uh, closing remarks to make? Because everybody's tired. Um, uh, we are this is the beginning for us.
I think Sarah brought up the point that we should have some more dissension on some of these panels. That's true. Our point of view, however, was that uh, the other side has so dominated the debate for so long. We have so much to do to correct the misinformation and mythology out there. We have to get all these very well-educated, well-established uh, points of view out to you all and out to them. So this for us is just a first step. It's going to be on the web. It's video stream. We're going to put, uh, we're going to put the more of it on the web. We're going to have conversations on the web. We're going to have another uh, panel in early June on uh, uh, government and growth and uh, equity. Uh, we'll announce that to you. Uh, it'll be in D.C. and um, we're just going to keep going. Now I'd like to pass out a collection box like they do at church <laughs> because we can't keep going without money. So if any of you are big time donors, uh, Hillary is standing back there to collect some money. Uh, Looks like the church. I, I doubt big time donors last this long. <laughs> so I felt free to say that without insulting anybody. In any case, uh, we'll let you know about the next one. Thank you very much. We're very excited about this. As I say, it's a first step.